So I thought by way of an introduction to the material that we're going to be studying, we'll take a look at an overview of genetics over these first couple of videos. This is all information in chapter one, uh, and we'll basically give you some vocabulary to use uh, when we're talking about genetics. So let's take a look at uh, what we're going to be studying. Uh, to start with, genetics, the term, means a biological transfer of information. Uh, that means that we're going to be taking information, biological information, we're going to be transferring it. We're going to either be doing this within a cell, or within an organism, or between organisms in a population. There are different levels that we're going to study. We're going to start at very small with DNA. We're going to move up to genes, chromosomes, genomes, the cell, individuals, families, and populations. Starting small, moving our way up. To start with DNA, the molecule, the molecule that contains the biological information. The DNA stands for d deoxyribonucleic n nucleic and A acid. That's the name of this molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid. It's made of three major parts. A base, specifically a nitrogenous base. Those are the, what give them the, uh, the bases their names, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, or A, G, C, and T. A sugar, in the case of DNA, that sugar is called deoxyribose. That's where the D comes from. And finally, phosphate bridges. So three components of DNA. Base, sugar, phosphate. Lots and lots and lots of those make up a molecule that is essentially six feet long. Three billion base pairs in length. Huge molecule. And only 3% of that is actually used to make protein. The rest of it has got some regulatory function and some other things. This is the information molecule. DNA is split up into genes. And genes are sequences of DNA, sections of DNA, groups of bases, that code for a particular protein. Uh, if you think of DNA as a long story or set of instructions, then the genes are the words. And how you spell those words is very important because if you spell them incorrectly, then they might not be easily understood. And since you're trying to build an individual with the information in DNA, you want those words to be understood. Now, it's possible to spell the words slightly differently and still get the meaning across. If you have genes within an individual or population, that have slight differences in their sequences. In other words, if you have the, the genes, the words, and they're slightly spelled slightly differently, but the meaning's still okay, those are called alleles. So an allele is just a different spelling of the same word, a different sequence of bases of the same gene. You, within your cells, have two copies of every gene, and those two copies may not be spelled exactly the same. Does one came from mom, one came from dad. As long as they're spelled relatively close to one another, you should be fine. The misspellings or the changes in spelling are caused by mutations. And a mutation is when you change the sequence of bases in a gene. There are different types of mutations that we're going to talk about, but it's just they all change the sequence of bases in a gene. Now the word mutation sounds like it's nasty, it sounds like it's dangerous, but they're not all harmful. Yes, some are harmful. Some changes in the sequence of bases give a gene that is no longer understandable by your cells, and therefore the protein that's made doesn't work. You've got a problem. Some mutations are innocuous. In other words, they're harmless. They don't have any effect, or no effect that, uh, that would uh, cause any change in life. Blonde hair, for example, is a mutation, but it has no bearing on survival at this point. And finally, mutations can be beneficial. They can be good for you. There's a mutation that we'll talk about later on which makes an individual immune to HIV. That's a good thing. And yet it's still a change in the spelling of the g a particular gene in that person's DNA. If you have a change in spelling, and that change in spelling of that word, in other words, the change in basis in a gene, is found in 
at least 1% of every individual in that population, then we call that a polymorphism. So blonde hair is an example. More than 1% of the general population has blonde hair. That means that more than 1% of the population has that variation, and therefore that's a polymorphism. The genes live on chromosomes. So chromosomes are bodies that are made up of DNA, some RNA, and some protein. And you only really see them when a cell is about to divide. It's an, a transport mechanism, really, for DNA. But it also allows us to organize this long six-foot molecule into easily recognizable chunks. These little worm-like structures are, are human chromosomes. And uh, that's where the genes live. They live on the chromosome. So we usually talk about where a gene is located based on the chromosome it's found in. Uh, every cell of your body, with few, a few exceptions, has contains 23 of these chromosomes and then a copy of each one of them, so 23 pairs. Uh, 22 of those pairs are called autosomes. Everybody has 22 pairs of chromosomes. Every human has the same 22 pairs of chromosomes. And then you have a pair of sex chromosomes. The 23rd pair it might vary a little bit depending on your gender. So if you're a female, you have two copies of the X chromosome, and if you're a male, you have one X and one Y. The chromosomes are numbered. Chromosome number one is the longest chromosome, and they decrease in size from there on down to 22. The X chromosome, you'll notice, is a little out of sequence. It's fairly large, uh, but it is a sex chromosome, and so it's considered separately, and the Y chromosome is fairly small. But uh, all of these chromosomes together 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way down to 22, plus either X or Y is a complete set of genetic instructions called a genome. And since you have two copies of each of these chromosomes in each one of your cells, you have essentially two genomes in each cell. A backup copy of your genetic information, if something should break. That's a good thing. This is a map of chromosome 19, one of the 22 autosomes. And each one of the little blue and red terms are genes that have been found on this particular chromosome. The chromosome is a sausage-shaped structure. It has two arms, a short arm called the P-arm and a longer arm called the Q-arm. And those arms are divided into bands or regions in which we find certain genes. So on one chromosome, all of these different genes, you have about 22,000 23,000 genes, different genes on your DNA that code for protein. Those genes in the DNA are all packed into structures called cells. Complex living organisms are made of cells. Each cell, again except for a few specific ones, but each cell generally contains all of your genetic information twice, two copies of each gene. Your cells in a complex organism like humans, your cells have different functions. So you've got liver cells and skin cells and bone cells and astrocytes or neural cells and lymph node cells and, and uh, cells that make up your endocrine system. They all have specialized jobs. And so when you're developing as an embryo, your cells differentiate. They undergo a process called differentiation where they become specific for a specific task. You start out as stem cells. Stem cells are undifferentiated. They're not specialized. They're pluripotent. And given the right set of chemical signals, they can transform themselves into a different type of cell to do a specific function. So these specialized cells become tissues. Tissues become organs. Organs become organ systems. And then you have an organism, all made of cells, about 6 trillion of them or so. Individuals have two copies of each gene and the spellings of those two copies are important. The particular spelling that you have of each copy of your genes is called your genotype. How that spelling manifests itself, how it's shown to the world, is called a phenotype. The, there are generally, for most of these different types of traits, there are, are generally two types two types of spellings, a dominant spelling, dominant allele, and a recessive spelling. I'll give you the classic example, tongue rolling. If you can roll your tongue, then you have what's called the dominant trait. That is your phenotype, because that's what people can see. Yes, you can roll your tongue, 
you have the dominant phenotype. No, you can't roll your tongue. That's the recessive phenotype. You can see the phenotype. You can't see the genotype. You don't really know what the spellings of those two genes are without doing a complete genetic sequencing. However, if you can roll your tongue, you have the dominant phenotype. And in order to have the dominant phenotype, one of your two spellings has to be the dominant spelling. Both of them could be, but at least one has to be. If you can't roll your tongue, you have the recessive phenotype, and both of your genes' spellings have to be the recessive one. And we'll talk more about this when we get to Mendelian genetics, but genotype is the specific spellings of the genes, the specific sequence of bases. Phenotype is what you see when, when that, that trait is expressed. Individuals are made up of families. Family is a group of individuals linked genetically. This weird looking map is called a pedigree, and it is a way of representing biological relationships between individuals. You're going to make a pedigree later on for certain traits in your family. Finally, we have populations. And a population in genetics is a large pool of alleles. In other words, a large number of individuals that have alleles that we can look at. And we're going to, we're going to take a look at those alleles and see how often they occur, frequency. That's called population genetics. Your population is essentially defined by the person doing the observation. You may belong to a bunch of different populations. Maybe you're a member of the population of people descended from Germanic tribes but you're also the member of a population of Edgewood students. And you're also the member of a population of uh, Caucasian females. The population is just a way of describing a particular set of conditions. So in the next video, we'll take a look at some of the uses of this information and some of the applications.